some of our elders can actually see when the spirit is gone. When dealing with critical illness or um, nearing death, um, every family is different, but typically every family will have a spokesperson. And so it's really important to identify ahead of time who that's going to be. Once illness sets in, the roles and responsibilities of the mother clan and the father clan are different. The, the father side is always the ones that is looking after the disease when it happens. Our families, our communities come together and to support the immediate family, the extended family, and the clan family. And uh, there's a lot of pouring of love, a lot of prayers. Family and friends will start bringing refreshments, they'll start, start bringing, so that the families don't have to worry about going home. Um, and it's just being that support. I think it's very important to have um, family there and friends um, to be around us, to support us, uh, pray for us. Uh, they're there to feed us and um, especially for the young ones to be there to witness uh, what we have to go through during the time of a death. Um, it's very important for them to know uh, how we feel and um, see the experience so they can believe. I find nowadays that it's very, uh, a lot of the families keep their children away because they don't want them to experience this um, heartache that we're going to go through. I had that experience with my brother and I'm still paying for it today. I didn't want to tell him that my mom was dying just so I wouldn't hurt him. So I think it's very important that we bring our children, our grandchildren to see what's going to happen. The one or two people, it depends, one, two or three people may be assigned to sit with the um, person that's near death. To be, and these people are from the father clan, and they are to take care of the a family's comfort at that time. If a person is on the verge of dying, they can start getting numbers on the charts of who's going to be taking care of them. That way, if they can phone the Tillolocks, as we call them, instead of asking the, peop the grieving people who's going to be taking care of her. Uh, who the spokesperson is. Who is going to, you know, who's the one that's going to sign the papers in, when, when death comes, when, who is going to be, who's going to be the one that's going to go talk to the nurses that, of what they need. Uh, who's going to be supporting the husband or the wife or the mom or the dad in going and listening to what the doctor has to say. I know a lot of the medical terms stump a lot of people and you know, they're turning to others if they don't understand the terminology. You know, and some are lucky that if they have that support system that knows exactly what's going on to turn to. Um, and it is good to see that there are the supports in the hospitals where they will come and check with the family to see what do you need? What can I do for you? Oh, it's always good to be asked those questions. The Gitsen would uh, notify their house chief of, of whoever is ill or, or is near death. And uh, the word would be spread out to the clan members and they would all uh, come to the hospital. It was all agreed upon. Uh, everybody knew that if you're a clan member, that's what you did in support of the family. For death, everybody pays their respect, feeds the grieving family, and supports them. And Almost the whole community shows up for 
services or go pay their respect and sit with the family. Uh, hospital staff are not able to approach somebody from the family directly, then they should c communicate with the uh, father clan representatives that are there. They're the, the support system for that individual. They need to know, know the name of that person because there's going to be phone calls coming in asking questions for that nurse and that nurse can just direct them. And you'll hear it often in Smoke Feasts that they have come to comfort and show support and that the family is not alone and then following them would be the community would come as well showing that they have communal support meaning that they're all grieving together it's always there there's nothing that we can do about it except being together being together Think together, work together, that's the only way. And also those individuals can also serve as um, support to the staff of the hospital, especially if there's a requirement, you know, um, you're near death but you're also, there's a health risk involved, just inform the Father Clan people there that, you know, this is our wishes uh, because, and this is for a safety reason. And so um, now that um, Father Clan representative will also be the ones to approach the people coming in to explain that to them. So it doesn't occupy the nurse's time also, it, it frees them up. And they also know who are the f immediate family members. They know to say, okay, yes, these people absolutely have to be in the room. The Father Clan is also there to uh, ensure that there's um, the environment for the family is is peaceful, and uh, uh, and also welcoming for visitors to come in. Sharing of food, uh, you know, it's a very difficult time in life for many people uh, in the family, and um, there's a lot of shock, the the grieving process, and you know, and so a lot of support comes in from the community, not only the community that the individual is from, but from neighboring communities. It helps a lot when there's people that come in and just help you, just someone to talk to or somebody to pray with. Once a person turns critical as they're on the way to the spirit world, Everything changes. Many people will show up and that's when the, I would say the process of crowd control would come in. She asked me to get all her kids together and we got all the people that she belongs to. and they brought her home. That's the thing about death. I, it was so sudden for us. It was so sudden. She, she was just around us and she had to go. They're supporting the family. They have cultural duties to do. There are spokespeople, there are undertakers. There are people who look after the mother the children, whether it's the, the widow, the wife, the husband, everybody has a role to play in that situation. It's a chain reaction. Once one of the people, the undertakers knew, and then that undertaker will phone everybody else. Especially when there's a huge um, influx of people and there's an, an emergency situation, then the, the hospital can make sure they identify who they can approach. Because um, again, we have our system and it's the father clan or the chiefs or the matriarch of the family. Th that established and then you can have your communication lines established. My grandmother was in the terrace hospital for four months, dying of cancer. And then towards the end when she became palliative care where um, we were just trying to make her comfortable. It was very limited, um, her visitors. I think there was only allowed 
like five to six people in a room at a time, which was challenging. Uh, I think they can improve by having somewhere where the family can bond together, like a private room or a chapel or, you know, something where we could sit and just comfort one another instead of being scattered all over the place. Um, through the death process, it's one where you need a lot of compassion. You know, you don't know what a person is going through, um, whether it's somebody that was close to the individual or somebody that's an extended member. And knowing that you can turn to somebody within the family that may be able to connect with um, other individuals having a hard time um, during the death process. Some may not want to be a part of it and distance themselves um, because they can't deal with it. So to support the family to members to let go of the individual. That's something that's really important because, um, and that's why our people show up in great numbers. Everybody basically has to say goodbye in their own way, even if it's just by being present at the hospital. That's their way of saying goodbye. Showing that person that, that it was very important for, to say, I thank you before you leave. In our culture, it's you go to say your final goodbyes. I know there's many that will hold back. As we've gone through that uh, death process and the person's passing, it was oh, cancer patients. It's trying to remember them for who they were and not somebody that's been laid to rest. So the family is encouraged to say their goodbyes, reinforce with the person that's dying that you're going to be okay without them in on this plane and it's okay for them to depart. We know that this is time for them to go. And it's it's important to respect, you know, continue that respecting them until they're they're gone to the spirit world. You'll have many many family members that will share the memories, uh, ones that will keep the family going and by sharing those memories. Um, it's not really forgetting what you're going through at that point. It's trying to push through it and trying to take everybody with you um, through that grieving process in hopes that everybody will be able to get it out. And our belief is that there's a prolonged dying process because the person that's dying is not happy yet. That's why there's so there's large numbers of people in the hospital. Um, it's also um, incredibly important to establish those networks of comfort and care and the only way that you can do that is when you're physically present. People have their roles to grow up knowing their roles and responsibilities uh, the spokesperson is typically going to be your uh, director for not necessarily the actual event, but for the feast, for the smoke feast, for the headstone uh, feast. So they need to be present and then have assemble their committees, essentially. Um, and so it's a very ordered process, and it starts uh, at the time uh, in the hospital. Each of us have our different ways. Um, Chai's last hours is different now, today, to say the Tsimsian, to the Gitsan, and to the Nisqat people. Hours are different, and the reason I say this is because I have witnessed the, um, the way the Nisqat carry their you know, cultural beliefs, their traditions, as well as the Tsimsian. But we as the Chayislas, we, we, we do ours a bit different. Your place, it's, it's like, it's almost like a political seat. If you're not in the House of Parliament by the time that the government is making its decisions, you're not part of the government. So it's the same 
principle. The introduction of food is comfort. It's, it's a traditional thing because we all know that when you're grieving, you're not eating. The food doesn't taste good. You, you don't want to do anything. You're in shock, you're in trauma. But the introduction of the food connects people together. The family will need a space to meet, to address their most immediate needs as a group. When a person is terminal, they've provided a large room because they understand that uh, everybody's gonna come. So again, the liaison person that's been established and the hospital can ensure all this also by identifying with the family who's, who's the person you want us to speak with, the primary person who will communicate everything back to you guys and who can communicate everything back to us. So there's a, that, that um, two-way communication established and, um, and not too many people approaching the hospital staff either. I really think it's just being there with them so that they wouldn't feel so alone. Just not to, so that they wouldn't be lonely. Mm -hmm. We were at the bedside of a recently deceased uh, person at the hospital and the nurse, the attending doctor and the nurse came in together and they just stood off to one side and let the family uh, gather by the bedside of their loved one and they th their presence there was just a support and I really appreciated that I appreciated that kindness and thoughtfulness so sometimes uh, it may look and feel overwhelming to some of the healthcare staff if it's in the hospital setting or in a, a medical doctor's appointment etc um, but to know that we're not going to be staying there, <laughs> you know, like for months and years, you know, it's, we're only there as long as we need to be there, and that's with the family. One of the best things that I've seen so far is the liaison that is chosen to go between the, uh, the Native family and also the administration of the hospital. So that all these little clicks are all taken care of and understood and things seem to go smoothly. So that, that would be really helpful to the family to know that uh, the hospital has identified that Aboriginal patient liaison right away to the family. And then they know that this person is available to support their needs in the hospital. It's very helpful to have um, one of our people in the institution of a hospital to help teach uh, the healthcare staff who are not Aboriginal or don't know our ways, you know, the, what is happening. Immediately following death, um, there's a time that the first the, the immediate family is spent time around the, the bedside of the deceased. In, in saying last farewells. And usually that can take some time. It can take up to three hours some time. And I'm not sure that all um, healthcare workers are aware of that timeline. But it's very important because the Native community believe that the soul of that person, the spirit of that person lingers there uh, immediately following death and it gives them an opportunity to express their last thoughts and uh, also to comfort one another at the, that time, which in, helps in healing. It's all along the lines of having the compassion, um, not rushing the family once the person does pass. It's taking the time um, allowing them to have that closure. It's, it's all in the compassion and giving them the time to heal on their own because we all heal in our own way. That's passing on and the people that are still going to be around. Before the person is taken down to the morgue, they put them in a large room where the family come in and view them before they take them down to the morgue. 
I was chosen to go in and witness that she was taken from the room. And uh, I had the worst experience in my life uh, when they came to pick her up and put her in a body bag uh, right in front of me. So if it can be done when they're down at the morgue in a more respectful manner. It was a very, very hard thing to deal with for me to witness them putting her in a body bag and taking her away. That's my first experience ever. I've never experienced anything like that. But you know, being chosen um, because a lot of people turn to me for help like this when there's a death or whatever. I can't say no. Out of respect for the family, I have to do what I have to do. And it's all out of love, you know, to help them out in any way I can. The hospital has its own roles and what it has to do next. But to whisk the body away, you know, before all the family members have come, that's considered a huge insult to the, to the family. And they really will, will feel that, especially in that, uh, the loss that they're exper experiencing. So someone will step up and say, no, we need to have that body there till everybody has arrived, all the family members have arrived, and they have uh, acknowledged that there is a death and that this, uh, this uh, the person has died. And that's, uh, we're visual. And we're also, we need to see that, yes, that person is now deceased. And now we know we're shifting into another gear into a, and another phase of our roles and our responsibilities within our cultural practices. Cultural practice is to bathe the deceased, a spirit, spiritual cleansing of sorts is what is going on. And um, again, it's the father clan um, auntie that was asked to, two aunts from the father clan are asked to complete this process in a private way, you close the curtains, and then um, the person is sponge bath, um, symbolically. So that's basically you do your prayers while you're bathing the individual and uh, support the individual to transition into the spiritual and heavenly realm. And also prior to having the body moved to the morgue um, or the viewing room, um, a minister is invited to say, offer a prayer for the family and also to offer a prayer for the deceased, for the journey of the deceased into the spiritual and heavenly realm. And um, if the minister is not available, there is no minister available, they might also choose an elder to do that. Uh, so an elder would be asked to do the prayer for the family. And that's done prior to the body being moved to the viewing room or to the morgue. The viewing room should be large enough to accommodate all the family. The family is, um, and family is the immediate family, that's the paternal side, and also the maternal side. So both family structures will be there and they will be present and they will be present in huge numbers. So you need to accommodate for the viewing that the, these numbers of people will be there. She passed away in the hospital here. And she was in, in the morgue for two weeks before somebody realized who she was. See, every village has a CHR. They can phone the CHR. Because basically CHR knows each person in the village and who's going to be taking care of that person. The cultural practices are something that each nation has lost because of um, different histories of our people, where we're living, um, residential school, everything that's happened to our people, the loss of the language in that nation, while other communities um, don't practice uh, some of those roles and responsibilities as much, and it could have a lot to do with maybe uh, geographics, uh, perhaps, you know, some communities are more isolated and 
integrated and practice their, their cultural ways um, more often than others. We are learning as we go along. Some of our young people are learning as we're actually practicing what we should be doing, our roles and responsibilities. Sometimes asking direct questions might be perceived as, as too forward. Um, First Nations tend to um, approach um, interactions more on a on a on a side to side as opposed to direct communication. So it's very key. I can't emphasize how how important it is for healthcare professionals to take the lead in asking those questions in in um, uh, peeling back the layers of uh, assumptions and finding out specifically how can we assist, how can we make any transition smoother. Um, and so it's, it's, it's more, um, things will go better if those questions are asked right away. Um, and then I've always found that when that happens, uh, those, those questions are, are met with relief almost, um, and, and uh, answers are immediate. So it's, it really just comes down to, to if you don't know, ask. Uh, I found that the administration is, is very good uh, to deal with, and I want to encourage them to keep on the practice yeah. of, of it.